Okay, perfect. All right, how's everybody doing? I'm Alex Grichewin. I know I'm not dressed up in my scrubs. Uh, this is just after the holiday seasons. I figure dress up in something a little more cat, a little more me, I feel. Uh, anyways, um, uh, we have a lot to talk about. I hope everyone had a great uh, holiday season. Everyone, you know, got a bunch of, spent time with their family, had a bunch of Christmas gifts and things like that. Um, mine was pretty decent. Mine was pretty decent. Very cold and, uh, on the eastern uh, side, so it was a little cold, but not too bad. Anyways, uh, there's a few questions coming up about how to decrease uh, an increase of, you know, your work of breathing, how to basically decrease it, um, as well as also how to increase it. I know it sounds silly because everyone's like, I want to be able not to feel winded when I work out. That's actually, there's something I need to bring up here. First off, uh, when we look at work of breathing, I know it seems a little difficult, a little vague, maybe a little ambiguous, but I want you to just kind of hear me out. There is nothing wrong with somebody being a little winded when they work out. It's a completely normal thing. I, I think a lot of people think that if they, uh, they're thinking that if they get out of breath, they're, they're, they have a disease, like they have short of breath. Short of breath is not a disease. It's just something that happens when somebody's working out and they get a little winded. Now, being winded, there, it's, that's very difficult for me to understand. When somebody says, Alex, I'm a little winded. It's like, what does that mean? You're a little winded. Can you continue? Yeah. So you're just letting me know you're winded? He said, well, I think something bad's happening. How's your oxygen? It looks good. How's your heart rate? A little elevated, but still looks good. So can you say more words? So we, we have to understand the work of breathing is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, so I drew, I drew up something very, very easy to understand, at least uh, not just to me, but uh, to, uh, to a lot of patients I, I see and help. So, so right now I have two lung, uh, two lung lobes. How many lungs do we have all together? Does anybody know? You can write in a good morning. You lost sound? Can you hear me okay now? Test, test. I'm hearing sound on this side. Do you hear sound now? Okay, so, so I drew up lungs. How many lungs do we have? A lot of people say we have two lungs. That's not correct. You, the question was how many lungs do you have, not how many lobes you have. You hear me now? Good, 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 good. How many lobes do you have? Right? I didn't, I didn't say how many lobes you have. I said how many lungs do you have? So you, if you want to give an answer, go ahead and write up an answer of how many lungs do we have? A lot of people say, I have two. It's like, no, you have two lung lobes, but that's not actually what I asked you. No, we don't have two lungs. We have two lung lobes, yes. So right lung, you actually have five. You have five lung lobes. Five. Yes, very good, Gail. Five. You don't have one. You don't have one set. What do you mean you have one set? This isn't the Olympics. What are you talking about? <laughs> Pamela. Connie. What does one set mean? You have one set of lungs? That's it? So when, when the human body, the human species, the, or animals in general were created, you're only given one of everything? No, that's not it at all. So I drew up here lungs, okay? Now I'm not going over the segments. I, I just want you to understand. I want you to keep in the back of your head how many lungs do we have? We have five, okay? So we have five different segments. These lines that separate the lungs are called fissures, okay? If I took a, if somebody did a lobectomy and they took one lung out, one part, a partial lobectomy out, these will actually still function just fine. You know, these will still function. The only thing is now there's a void. There's a void where the lung used to be at, and that's obviously going to fill up in space. So how is that going to fill up? This by itself, this lung that now there's a void, is actually going to stretch itself out by itself. The lung will actually do that itself. Yep. 
We see that all the time. Now, worst case scenario, let's say you took a whole, a doctor had to take, a surgeon had to take a whole entire lung lobe out. And the heart that stay, stays mediastinal in the center, okay? <clears throat> now, if I took the whole entire lung out, what would happen to this lung? That's going to triple in size. There's a reason why I'm, I'm bringing up a, a very, very good, a complex question, but trying to make it easier for everybody to understand really quickly. This lung will actually triple in size. That one lung by itself, by itself will triple in size and the heart will actually get moved over, shift over to the right, depending on where the lobectomy was, and the heart will actually be found more underneath the armpit than in the center. We get that a lot, especially for complete lobectomies. Uh, the, the body can't live with a small volume. Your body by itself is, it knows this. It understands this. It understands that it can't live with a small volume. Okay, it's not made for that. Like, for instance, if I breathe really shallow right now, has anybody ever heard of the death space, uh, the dead space factor? So when air, let's say oxygen comes in, let's say oxygen comes in, and oxygen comes into your trachea, your, your windpipe, okay? Does oxygen get deposited in the blood at that point? No, of course not. That's not, well, that's not your alveolar capillary membranes. It has to reach all the way into the lungs to the alveolar capillary membranes in order for oxygen to get transported past the semi imperial membrane for that oxygen to be put into the blood. And then on exhale, the CO2 would get pulled out, okay? So if this whole lung right here, so this, this one lung will actually triple in size. The body can't live with a small volume. If I breathe really shallow, let's say I'm doing this. I'm breathing really shallow. Is that the same as me breathing in deeper? No, of course not. Me breathing shallow might not act. So there's uh, on dead space. Dead space, that means like the airway itself that doesn't make it not necessarily into the lungs. Even the bronchioles aren't uh, for gas exchange. It has to be met at the alveolar capillary space. So I'm just writing up a macroscopic view or a microscopic view. So if I pull the, uh, the lung parenchyma and open it up and just took a look at the alveoli under the microscope, I would see this would be the airway. These are the, this is the alveolar sac. So air has to transport into there. Oxygen gets passed through the semi impermeable membrane, deposited into the blood. Now at what depth, meaning how deep am I supposed to breathe in order for oxygen to come in and CO to come out? If I breathe like this, that might not be enough. That might not be enough at all. That might actually be completely horrible where I am breathing so shallow that it will be enough for a squirrel to live, but it wouldn't be enough for a human being to live. The dead space in somebody's airways, that's the nasal pharynx, the nasal pharynx, oral pharynx, down the trachea, bifurcates to left and right hemispheres of your lung lobes, okay, and then goes all the way up to the alveoli. That's all, that's all called dead space. If I breathe in 250 milliliters, I'm only filling up the dead space, okay, meaning if I breathe very shallow, oxygen didn't even get deep enough in order for it to go into my blood because I breathe too shallow. And then I see a lot of people like that. I see a lot of people asking, why am I getting so out of breath so quickly? Well, how deep are you breathing? Very good, halfway, I love it. So how deep are that, is that person breathing? Is the person breathing deep enough? Maybe they might not be breathing it deep enough, okay? If they're breathing really shallow, of course they're gonna, their heart rate's gonna spike, their oxygen's go down. Look, it's not rocket science. If your body needs a gallon of air and you're only giving it a teaspoon of air, your oxygen is gonna, you know, you're only inflating your lungs a little bit you're not going to be pulling enough oxygen in, meaning your oxygen level is going to go down when you start working out, when you start getting up and going. When you exhale, you're only getting rid of a little bit of CO2. You're not getting rid of a lot of CO2. You're only getting rid of a little bit of CO2. Okay, so if somebody breathes no sound at all again, can you uh, enable your, uh, just turn up your, um, your volume a little bit, please. 
Okay, because people are hearing me, but you're, it just says Facebook user, but there's no name. Can you say your name so we can at least acknowledge making sure that you're okay with your sound? Anyways, so air coming in, okay, at what depth is air coming in? At what depth? We halfway, remember? Okay, so we have to fill up our lungs. Do we fill up? So when we breathe in, how, what's the deepest should we be able to breathe in? How do we know what our deepest breath is? So it's a calculation. The calculation is very simple. It's 65 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. If you feel, let's say you feel that, oh, this is a lot of calculations, I can't do this. Well, that's why you don't have personal trainers doing this. You have clinicians. The clinicians do this. That's why it's a medical discipline. Okay, it's not something that we just tell somebody and expect them to do it correctly. We, we have to calculate. We, when we do a care plan and, in, and individualize everybody's therapy, we base it off of the person. Okay, like you have a patient that comes in, okay, that wants to see me. And that person, let's say, has uh, COPD. And specifically, they have emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And you have another person, let's pretend, same age, same weight, same height. And, still ha and also has the same diagnosis of COPD that is specifically, because remember COPD is an umbrella term. There's five types of COPDs. You know, just like heart disease is an umbrella term that defines, but you have to understand what type of heart disease is. There's a plethora of them. COPD, there's only five. So you have two people, same height, same sex, same uh, everything, same weight, everything. And even the diseases are the same, but their symptoms will be completely non-identical. They, they won't be the same, okay? You can't, you know, in therapy, when we do therapy, we have to structure our care plans because it has to be individualized. We have to structure our therapy based off of the person and the doctor's recommend, recommendation on their exercise prescription. So we have to follow those guidelines. Okay, so if a doctor, let's say Dr. Shaw wrote, all right, uh, bronchial hygiene, six minute walk test, pulmonary function test, uh, pre and post with um, uh, respiratory intercostal uh, diaphragmatic muscle strengthening with leg exercises and contraindications to shoulders uh, because somebody has a bad shoulder rotation, you know. So we base the therapies off of the person. We don't just throw up a thousand therapies up on a board and expect people to do them. That's that's not how this works, everybody. This is a this you're talking about a certified program, okay? This is a program, HRN. It's a program that does the, you know, the, the, does the rehabilitation itself. Now, what does rehabilitation mean? So rehabilitation doesn't mean cure. Rehabilitation means. Uh, if your goal is to come off oxygen, as long as that's realistic, you're going to come off oxygen. You know, there's no, I hope so, you know, there's no such thing. It's either we do it or we don't. So you have, uh, you have somebody that uh, can only walk, let's say, 50 feet, and they want to be able to walk 1,000 feet. That's very, very realistic. Um, it will take, you know, and let, let, let's also say somebody wants to have an increase in lung functions. Somebody who wants to have... Uh, to be able to do, to uh, make dinner for their spouse and go out, walk in the park, anything like that. That's, that's realistic, you know. The new year is about to start, of course, right? 2023? Well, there's a couple things to really under, uh, look at here is, you know, a lot of people are telling me that, oh, I feel like I'm in, you know, p people on Facebook, people on YouTube, people on Twitter, uh, and especially Instagram, um, people ask me, Alex, I'm at the worst case scenario. Uh, my doctor only gave me a few weeks to live. And I'm like, if you're feeling like you're in hell already, why would you stay in it? Why, why would you stay in it? You feel you, it's, you're in the worst, you're in the bottom. You're in the ground bottom of situations. Like you're in a hole. Why would you stay in it? Why? I mean, that, to me, that makes no sense to me. Like, why would you want to stay in that? You don't have to stay in something like that. 
get yourself out of it, right? That's, that's what we're trying to do. But, you know, <laughs> when, when we look at rehabilitation, we're looking at the person structured as a whole, as, as a person, not as a number, of course. In the pulmonary rehab program, if you're not understanding what this is, 65 milliliters per kilogram by the body weight. Let's do the math in our head, okay? Really quick, let's just do it in our head. Let's say, all right, so I'm six foot tall. Um, so, let's see, if I was 105, 5.2. All right, so, all right, so I'm six foot tall. My ideal body weight, which is based off of my height, okay? My ideal body weight is 180 pounds. What's 180 divided by 2.2 is 54, okay? 54, 81, 81. Okay, so let's round up because it's 81.8. Let's say 82. Okay, so take 82 multiplied by what now? Because what did I do? I took 180 pounds divided by 2.2 to give me 81.8. Just round up and say 82. So another way of me saying that I'm 180 pounds. Now, mind you, I'm not 180 pounds. I'm 200 pounds. But I have to go off of my ideal body weight. Okay, so my ideal body weight is 180 pounds. So I take 180 divided by 2.2, and that's going to give me 81.8. Just do the calculations. I'm always right with my calculations. So 81.8. Just round up. Just round up and say 82 kilograms. So I'm 180 pounds, right? Ideal body weight, and my other ideal body weight is converted from pounds to kilograms is 82 kilograms. So take 82 times 65 is what? Come on, real quick. 82 times 65, 5,330. Come on, see, it's easy math, guys. 5,330, okay? So 5,330, all right, so now I have my maximum lung volume for somebody who is six foot tall. Me, I'm six foot tall. Now, 5,330, do we have an incentive spirometer here? Let me grab mine, here, one second. Yes, I am singing in the rain. Okay. I, oh, oh, sorry. I brought this too. <laughs> For good reason. Here. Okay. A lot of people are breathing with a lung this size instead of a lung that's meant for your body. This is called an Ambu bag. I have a point to this. This Ambu bag roughly has around 750, 720 milliliters of volume. Mind you, 750 milliliters. We use this to keep people alive. Why is the reservoir so big? Because we're doing this to a human being. If we were doing this to somebody who had lungs this size, like a squirrel, and that's nuts, then the diaphragm, the, the reservoir, wouldn't be so large. So volume is very important. Now, let's measure volume. So I have here an incentive spirometer. I want to make sure I do this correctly. Can we get a close up on this? Just on this right here. Okay. So what I'm going to do this is a close up. Let's go a little bit close. There we go. All right. So my goal here on an incentive spirometer, remember, this is not an exerciser. Don't ever let any clinician fool you on that one because there's no weight. If you go into a gym, because a lot of people say, oh, this is an exerciser. No, it's not. He says, no, that's what my doctor said. Then tell your doctor to get the money back from school he went to. Because by the FDA, it literally states, this cannot exercise you. It has no weight. If you went into a gym and didn't pick up one single weight, would you grow muscle mass? Of course not. Okay. So this right here is the flow meter. This is the piston chamber. There's the piston I measure from the top. This right here is the marker. I don't have to worry about that, okay? All I need to do is keep that ball, that flow meter ball, in the middle the whole time, okay? So I'm going to do just that. Mind you, my maximum lung volume, according to calculation, is 5,330, but my incentive spirometer only goes up to 4,000. That means I should be able to bring up the piston all the way up and leave it up there for probably about a second or two, okay? So let's see if we're correct. So I take a deep breath in, I'm going to exhale all the way out. I'm going to keep talking until I can't talk anymore. And I'm just going to keep going, going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. 
So obviously, oh, we had to raise that up. Let me do that one more time. So I do a Shikani technique. There was this doctor that worked on President Reagan. His, do, his name is Dr. Shikani. And um, he actually taught me the Shikani technique. That's what I call it. It's the exhalation. So on exhalation, I tell, sometimes I tell people, do the Shikani technique. And so they, what they'll do is they take a deep breath in, they'll exhale, and start counting out loud until they can't hear themselves audibly. And once they do that, remember, if there's no air in your lungs, you can't vocalize. So that just reassures you that there's no air left in your lungs before you measured. Because if there's air inside your lungs as you're, you know, before you measured, and you inhale, how do you know what, how much volume that was in your lungs? You don't. So you have to get rid of it, right? So I'm going to take a deep breath in. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13. So I can leave it up there to the 4,000 for about that time. So roughly I'm maxed out on my lung volumes. So I'm good. Okay. Now let's go back on the board really quick. I'm trying to decrease my work of breathing. Oops. Let me just erase this part here. I'm trying to decrease my work of breathing. Remember, that's what the, the major question was. Okay, so I'm not gonna make this calculus. This is simple. This is gonna be in milliliters, okay? The, so this represents milliliters and also this represents in pounds, just different sections. So don't worry. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Big diaphragm underneath, heart stays right in the middle, but we don't have to write in the heart. So anyways, if I breathe in at 500 milliliters, you are not filling up 500 milliliters not going into this lung. It's actually only going to the top part of the lungs. Lungs, the top parts are smaller, okay? Top part of your lungs are smaller. They're called apex, okay? The smaller part of your lungs. Of course, these are really, really small. So lungs never ever open up like this. They open up top first, middle second, bottom is last. Okay, they don't open up like this. That's not how it works. Just look at the physics behind it. If the tops are smaller and the bottoms are larger, filling it up just by simple physics in your head, are you gonna, is, the, is the bottom gonna open up first? Think about it for a second. If the top is smaller, thinner, and the bottoms are bigger, the basal areas are larger, which one's gonna open up first? Well, let's, write, let's keep writing up. 500 milliliters, this is all that's filling up in your lungs. That's it. All this here is not being used when you breathe in that shallow. Now, let's say also that here contributes to, when you did a pulmonary function test, it was 13% FEV slash F. VC1, okay, meaning the force vital capacity divided by the force expiratory volume, okay, that's the, that's the, in one second, that means how fast I can exhale in one second, how fast, <sighs> okay, determines how severe my COPD is, okay, if I can exhale full volume, and I, let's say I fill up my lungs 100%, and I can exhale it all out in less than three seconds, I'm not, my lungs are actually not that bad. But if, let's say, I exhale and it's still coming out little by little, but it's only coming out really slowly, and it took about 13 seconds, 12 seconds, to exhale all the air out of my lungs, then obviously I have more severe COPD. If I could do it within three seconds, don't have COPD. Okay? Because remember what COPD is, it's chronically obstructed, right? So let's say the 13% FE, the is coming from the top parts. Why? Because that's what you're exposing. When you breathe that shallow, let's say smoke inhalation, pollution, household cleaners, dust pollen, whatever. The top part is what's being exposed to the smoke inhalation, pollution, household cleaners, dust pollen, whatever, right? So the top is what's being exposed currently. You're not exposed in the bottom because you can't open up the bottom because you haven't been able to breathe that deep yet. So is the 13% accounting for the bottom lungs? No, because you can't open it up 
to, for it to be measured by the machine, the, the, the pulmonary function test. Okay. Remember what the subject is right now, how to decrease work of breathing. I want you to understand something. If you're breathing too shallow, no matter what you do, you're always going to be a little winded. Okay, but a little winded doesn't mean unmanageable. So we have to understand where that fits in. Like where, where, like, because my work of breathing is different from them than somebody else's work of breathing. I'm working out. My work of breathing is going higher. My work of breathing is going higher. Which one am I at? Not all in the five school guts. So I'm there working out, okay? As I work out, my my CO2 is going to climb from lactic acid building up, turning into CO2, my lactic acid. When I contract the muscle, it produces lactic acid. That buffers out, turns into CO2. The out of breath feeling is caused by CO2, not oxygen. Oxygen is not the culprit that is out of breath. For instance, carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Does it ever, just look it up when you get a chance, look up carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay? Uh, especially parts per million above 25 parts per million. Okay, 25 parts per million above. Okay, is there oxygen in that person that has COPD, uh, that has carbon monoxide poisoning? Barely. Okay, barely. All right. Now, does the symptoms, the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning, does it ever state you're out of breath? No, never does but there's no barely any oxygen in the person's body. So if what you thought was true, that would be completely contraindicated. Oh, that will contradict that, is what I mean. Completely contradict that. What you thought oxygen, well, Alex, why am I out of breath with, when my oxygen is going down to 80? Because you're breathing like a turkey. You're breathing like a squirrel, man. You're not pulling in enough oxygen in, and you're definitely not getting rid of enough CO2. Of course you're going to be winded. You're not breathing in deep enough for a human being. You're breathing in deep enough for a squirrel. Okay? The best you can do is probably sit there and don't do anything. Well, that's not what we want. So, the 13%, let's say it's accounting for the top. Well, what I can open up. Because I measured with an incentive barometer, all I can get to 500, let's say. If I increase volume, and let's say I increased it, and I got to the areas that were good in my lungs, And let's say they weren't exposed, which usually is always true, where we always find out. The 13% would increase to what? Your lung stage, your, 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 lung, your disease stage, will go from 13% to what? Well, these are not as damaged as the ones on the top. So they're obviously above 80. So what would this turn into be? 87%. Without, without flinching. But the person would have to increase volume, one, two, three. And uh, look, um, these ribs, the intercostal spaces, people tend to concentrate on the diaphragm the most. Okay? But that's not actually how it works. Uh, the diaphragm, look, let me grab a, they have a therapy band. Let me grab a therapy band. Oh, sorry. It's a respiratory muscle strain. Let me grab a therapy band to kind of explain this. And I know you can still hear me. Okay, just, just look real quick, okay, just look real quick. Okay, if I pull, so, mu so muscles, when I contract the muscle, if I contract the muscle, okay, muscles never push, they only pull. So I have one muscle to pull a forearm, I have a bicep to pull it, I have another muscle, the tricep, to pull it back. Okay, so inside, in your ribs, between your ribs, ever eat your ribs? Those muscles, those are for respiratory. That's a respiratory muscle. Okay. So if I inhale, and let's say I exercise only my diaphragm and I don't work out the intercostals. This is why this never worked in rehabilitation centers. This is not my theory. This is a proven thing. Okay. You just, I remember, I can't bring up fabrications. I can't do things like that. I'm a licensed clinician under the Maryland Board of Physicians. I have to be, because I expect you guys to do your own research. Okay, after the show, right, after this. So muscles pull. If I worked out the diaphragm, okay, is this getting bigger? It's getting longer, sure, but is it getting, is it widening up? No, diaphragm pulls. The lung actually thinned out when it pulls in this direction. 
Then I have intercostals. What's the job of the intercostals? Pull them sideways. Okay. If I work both muscle groups at the same time, diaphragm and intercostal, I get the largest surface area possible stretching out my lungs the way it's supposed to be to get air inside. Right? Okay. So if I neglect the intercostals and work out only the diaphragm, which you should, no clinician should ever be showing you only diaphragmatic breathing for breathing itself. You know, you, let's say, let's say uh, uh, I see a lot, I see maybe about three people a year with this type of complication. They have a paralyzed diaphragm, paralyzed diaphragm, whether they can't breathe in, they need to be on a ventilator the whole time. So watch this. I want to show you something here. Okay. Let me go on this one. Sorry, we, uh, um, there's a lot of cameras here, so I'm trying to get used to this. No worries. Okay. So first off, watch, watch how my breathing is, okay? So this is diaphragmatic. Um, mind you, let, let me start with a regular breath. Regular breath, my chest should come up, my diaphragm should come, distend my d stomach, right? My diaphragm comes out. So here we go. Exhale. Now, diaphragm only. My chest, watch my chest. My chest will not move. Diaphragm only. <sighs> Diaphragmatic muscle breathing only. Chest only, okay? Those are intercostals only. Diaphragm, watch. My diaphragm will not move. <sighs> then you have the person who has a paralyzed diaphragm. And the doctor was only, or not the doctor, because the doctor doesn't learn therapy. They learn uh, procedures and, and uh, medicine. So do for those that don't know, doctors don't go to medical school to learn physical therapy and, and stuff like that. They go to school to learn procedures and, and uh, you know, what. <laughs> I hope you understand. Uh, you don't ask a doctor to do therapy, you know, unless it's a psychologist, psychiatrist. You know, that's different. So anyways, and this is a physical type of therapy. So... Let's say the person that came in uh, had a paralyzed diaphragm. They had their physical therapist only work, even the physical therapist. Let's say it was a respiratory therapist. Um, a respiratory therapist working only the diaphrag diaphragmatic muscles out. Now the person, uh, you know, God forbid, but let's say it happened. The person got into a little bit of an accident, fell, or did something where the diaphragm is now paralyzed. Now the person is, there's no point but to, you know, just start digging a grave and that's it. Okay, uh, so I see about three people like this per year, three people. So it's not very, very common, okay? Um, so when they come into this program, I will tell them, don't worry about your diaphragm. It's paralyzed, it's no good anymore. What I'm going to have the person do now is work intercostal and back intercostal muscles out. Watch this. You probably would have to pan over to me to see all this. I'm going to sit in the chair. Okay, all right. Now, I'm going to paralyze my diaphragm by leaning all the way over, making sure that my diaphragm cannot, cannot expand, okay? Because it's kind of hard to breathe like this, right? No, that's only for people that are untrained. So if I did this and worked out my back intercostal muscles and I did something like this, watch my volume. My piston is going to go up. So a lot of doctors would think that paralyzed diaphragm, you cannot inhale anymore. You can't breathe in anymore, right? So that's not true. If I did something like this, I pilled up my volume quite significantly. How did I do that? I worked out back intercostal spaces. Remember, there's always two sets of something. Two sets. Okay, if the if your diaphragm is paralyzed, work out the back intercostal muscles and you don't have to be on a ventilator. It's not rocket science, everybody. It's pretty simple. It's just basic need. Now, a person will have an increase in lung functions, sure. Now, once you increase this person's lung functions, now you have another problem. Shortness of breath. Because the person probably hasn't worked out for a very long time. Can we agree or disagree? Yes! Probably the person was, you know, every time they got up, they just got so winded, so they just didn't really exercise much. Okay, so is there a such thing as somebody can be out of breath because they're out of shape? Of course. Is there a such thing as somebody can be out of breath because they have no lung disease? 
Yes, think about it. Okay, can you be out of breath because you have a heart complication? Yes, has nothing to do with the lungs. You can have atrial fibrillation and that's literally one of the symptoms. You don't have to have lung disease. So Alex, I'm trying to decrease my work of breathing. Okay, so as you're working out, how many words can you say? And the, the person will probably tell me, uh, I, don't, I, I didn't check. I said, maybe you want to check. And it's like, how about this? We know, and, and for people that have been, that actually uh, have seen the, the Borg scale with the talk test, I'm going to kind of bring that up. So be a little bit of a recall. So I'm working out, how many words should I be able to say to determine if I should keep going or stop? Anybody? How many words should I be able to say? Four words, okay, or more. So if I can say my breathing is manageable. So let me do this. So if I can say my breathing is manageable, I'm between a four, five, and six on a Borg scale, meaning I'm good. My RPE, rate of perceived exertion, is around a four, five, and six as well. So let's say I'm working out and I did this. My breathing is manageable. How out of breath am I? I'm at an eight. I'm saying one word every breath, I'm two out of breath. Okay. No, not a four. An eight. You see, it was one word every breath. If I could do this, my breathing is manageable, so my breathing is fine. If I can say and talk full sentences, my work of breathing is obviously not very high. It's a good guess though, guys, but that wasn't the right answer, okay? So if I'm doing this, my breathing is manageable. I would be at a four. Four would be easy. I'm obviously huffing and puffing when I have to say that. So I can't be at a four, I would be at an eight. Okay, let me bring up the Borg scale again really quick. Just real quick. Because somebody asked, uh, always asked me the same thing. What can I do at home? What can I do? I said, you got to be in therapy. There's no, I wish I can tell you, look, just eat an apple every single day and, and you know, go for a jog once in a while and drink plenty of water. I, I, it, that would be the most ridiculous thing in the world. You know, um, the American Association of Respiratory Care uh, in 2022, I believe in April, it is April, uh, it's the April Magazine. They, um, they show that uh, people that go online to do YouTube videos where there's no peer review had the worst outcomes because there was no clinician overseeing them. There was no clinician seeing that, okay, that person has a bad leg, so obviously you wouldn't work out a bad leg, you know, else that might exacerbate that and, and create more injury, you know. So they did a study out of 100 people, they saw the outcomes were ridiculous. You know, I mean, we don't do YouTube videos. I mean, we, we put things on videos, but we're actually licensed clinicians. You don't know that on some, you know, some video thing, you know, or something like actually has a certified doctor or a certified or a registered, you know, nurse or a registered respiratory therapist, or you don't know that, you know, obviously I always give my license out so I can, so people can look up and see that, oh yeah, he is under the Maryland Board of Physicians. I do that all the time. I always like doing that. I earned that degree, man. <laughs> Anyways, let's like it right at the Borg scale. Borg, B-O-R-G, okay, Borg scale. Oh, and by the way, there's only two calculations in a pulmonary rehab program. There's only two, okay? So the other one is the 220. Just in case, if you want to write a note, 220 minus your age, okay? That's your maximum heart rate. So let's say I'm 85. 220 minus 85 is 135. 135, then I need to be at 40 to 60, 60 to 75, 75, oops, 75 to 80. That's my range. So let's say I'm uh, 135, 135 times 0.4 is 54, and then 135 times 0.6 is 81. 81. This is 81 as well, because that's the same. Cross these out. Uh, 135 times point, uh, point 0.75 is 101.2. 101.2. To 135 times point 0.8 is uh, 107. Now, so my range for my pulse rate range would be 54 to 107 if I was 85 years old. Okay, 
low intensity, moderate intensity, high intensity. When you're sticking with a workout routine, you always start with low intensity, staying in there for about five minutes. But guys, if this sounds like a lot of stuff and it sounds very confusing, that's the reason why we went to school so long for all this stuff. That's why it's good to be in the rehab program so you can go through this. Anyways, so that was that. Now let's bring up the Borg scale. Borg scale obviously starts with a zero, ends with a 10. It's zero to 10, 10 being the worst, zero being the least. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? Remember, this scale is subjective. It's how you feel as a person. Seven is a magic number. The range that you want to stay at is four, five, and six. Okay, so if somebody was saying, let's put a talk test underneath this, I'll put a talk test right here. Talk test, okay? If I'm within this bracket, it's not, I'm dead, I'm just, I am not very happy. Because <laughs> I am very out of breath where I can't even catch my breath at all. So a talk test underneath this would be a one. Meaning one word every breath would, would determine that I'm at an eight. Nine and a 10, I wouldn't be able to say one single word. I'll be too, I'll be like this. And I can't even talk, okay? That means you're way too out of breath. Seven, two words every breath. My breathing is, it's gonna be there. I'm a, that's a seven, two out of breath, okay? Six, three words every breath. My breathing is manageable. So you're still in an okay zone, it's just at the maximum limit. Five, let me make sure these go down. Five, I would say four words every breath. What are our magic four words? My breathing is manageable. Remember that. If you can say that, you're good. You should keep going. Four, five words. And of course, the numbers keep increasing. So let's put this to a test really quick. I'm working on saying my breathing is Manageable, where do I fall at on a Borg scale? Eight, because I'm saying one word every breath. Now let's say this, my breathing is, so let's say I'm working out, I'm doing this. My breathing is manageable, so my breathing is okay. Now where do I fall at on a Borg scale? Come on guys, give me an answer. Come on, let's put those thinking hats on. It's right there. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you, man. All right, so, <laughs> Such a clinician, I speak so well, don't I? No, uh, I am a clinician, I just, I don't like to talk a lot of medical jargon for people that don't understand me very much. So anyways, um, I said my breathing is manageable, so my breathing is okay. So actually, I wouldn't even fall in here. I'd be all the way down over here. Zero, very good. Pamela, very good. Facebook users, zero. Very, very good. I wouldn't be able to, I can say so many words. Right? I can say so many in one, one sentence. So obviously my work of breathing isn't very high. Anything in this level, you're completely content and happy. What that also means if anybody works out on this level, they won't gain anything. They won't benefit from the exercise. Okay? It's just, it's not, you're not increasing your work of breathing so you can handle increased work of breathing. I see this all the time in a gym where somebody's on a treadmill and they work out for like 30 minutes on a flat surface you know, on a, on a treadmill, just flat, no inclines, just on a flat surface, going about two miles an hour. And they're like, I still can't go upstairs. And I've been doing this on a treadmill. I said, because that's all you're tolerating are flat surfaces at a low speed. You're not putting in hills. You're not increasing the speed up for like, you know, maybe about 10, 15 seconds. You're not putting in hills. So you're never tolerating stairs. You're never tolerating hills. So of course you can't handle hills. All you've been tolerating is completely well. Right, because you're not increasing your work of breathing. You know, in the military, we went out, uh, went out Mount Agony, and they call it Mount Agony for people that are ever at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, they call it Mount Agony because the hill is so steep on Mount Agony, as you're climbing, you can touch the, the, the floor. It's that steep. Because people, when they're climbing, they're like, they can pretty much, with a 40 pack, a 40 pack when your BDU's on, 40 pack uh, sack on, you're going up this hill. This hill was so steep. 
because by the time you reach the top and you're in agonizing pain, that's why they call it Mount Agony. So it's just incredible how, how crazy that is. Anyways, so the reason why in the military they do that is because you can, so you can tolerate hills. At first, we don't expect anybody to ever reach the top. After a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more, you know, I always ask people, how do you eat an elephant? What are you talking about? How do you eat an elephant? You know how to eat an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? And they're like, what do you mean, I, I, elephant? I say, yeah. If you were to eat an elephant, how would you do it? And you have to eat the whole thing. Yeah. How would you do it? 5.4 tons. How would you do it? Huh? 223. Sorry, 3,200 tons. 3,200. 3, 3.2 ton, 3 tons. Okay? Elephant approximately weighs. Some, anyways, how would you eat it? One bite at a time. Little by little, and you always make it. Instead of trying to go all the way, <laughs> I'm not here talking about how to eat an elephant. I'm just saying that you know to tackle something that is very advanced, you have to approach it softly, very slowly first. Get yourself to be comfortable. If you go into a situation you're completely uncomfortable, your anxiety is going to go all the way up to the roof. So, anyways, four, five, and six is where I want to stay at when I work out. I never want to be at this level here. Okay. All right, so 8, 9, and 10 is something I don't ever want to be. This number 7 is a number telling you to slow down or stop. 4, 5, and 6 is the workout zones you should always be at. Now, if we were to plug in those numbers before, like the uh, 40 to 60, 60 to 75, 75 to 80, this would actually be in here. And that's how we do a strategic workout routine for somebody. A 4 would be 40 to 60% of their maximum heart rate. This would be 60 to 75%, and this would be 75 to 80% of the person's maximum heart rate. Okay, remember, it's based off of your age. Uh, volumes are based off of your height. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions here. And if you have, oh, let's see, I was answering the question, but how many words should you be able to say? Oh, I got you, no worries. Kathy, go off the chat and come back in. All right, no, no worries. All right, there's a question here. Is 88% bad for your oxygen? Well, in exercise, it's common for oxygen to go down. We don't like large fluctuations, but it does happen where somebody's oxygen levels go down a little bit, down to 88, it's not going to kill you. Okay, but think about it. Where's the pulse ox located? It's on your finger. You're not measuring what you brought into the body, so you're at the very end of line of sight, you still have 88% of oxygen in the blood the body could consume, but it's not going to because it already has its plenty plentiful share. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so 80%, 88% is not bad. 80% still, that's some people's normals. You can live 100 plus years at 80%. I don't know what they're feeding or telling you in some of these facilities, but they shouldn't be giving you bad information, especially, and don't go on Wikipedia. You don't go on Wikipedia, okay? Don't go on Wikipedia for facts. Come on, we gotta be smart, we gotta be smart. Where are our three major reference points? Our references, when we want to know facts, where do we go? Come on, everybody. Look, you see these wonderful water bottles? Look at this, it's a weight that we're giving to patients. It's a water bottle, it weighs about five pounds. And then you can just decrease the weight by taking some of the water out. We give these to patients. I will give one out for free to any of you guys right now. Be a little smarter, where do we find our facts? Come on, give me one. I'll give you 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Guys, it's free. Come on. It's all over for you. 2, 1. All right. I'm going to repeat the question one more time to give you another 10 seconds. Okay. Where do I find my facts from? No. Where do I find my facts from? No. Where do I find facts from? Come on, guys. Here. Come on. <laughs> Kathleen, you're so close. Come on, I'm giving you plenty of time. Come on, free water bottle. It weighs five pounds, and plus you can drink it and hydrate yourself. How do you decrease? Yeah, come on now. Where do I? No, no. Uh, Pamela, you don't. <laughs> I love that you find the facts from me, but it's not where you get the facts. I, I have to mention the facts. I have to talk about the facts. I, I don't make up the facts myself. So wh which resource do I go to, guys? FDA is not a bad one, but that's not, that's Food and Drug Administration. I need something for clinical. Come on, I'll give you a little bit more time. A free water bottle, and it's awesome. It's a weight, 
You can lift and do some deltoids. Everything. Come on, don't you want one? Come on, show me. A doctor? A doctor used to say no. No, doctor's not the. No. All right, I have to give you the answer. Um, so there's a lot of resources. You could have picked any one of those resources. No, you don't find the facts from your lung doctor. Um, you have to go off of what your doctor reads to notify, to see facts. Okay, so that's the American Association of Respiratory Care, American Chest Physician Guidelines, American Thoracic Society. You can even have went with the American Lung Association. Google, Pamela, get rid of that. <laughs> Google, you might as well just put, uh, 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 what's, the, uh, what's the horrible one? Go, oh, yeah, Google. Yeah, that's the worst one. Why would you pick Google? Don't pick Google, Pamela. What is that? That was a joke, right? You're kidding, right? Come on. That was a joke. I, okay, I, I really hope so. <laughs> Don't ever use Google. No, you're going to risk your life on how to do tracheostomy and you're going to type it on Google? <laughs> no, it's American Chest Physician Guidelines. No, you know, you don't do that, Pamela. In that case, you let me know, and then I'll let you know the fact by looking it up on the right resources. Okay, no worries. My facts, I can't make up facts. I have to base facts off of their original, you know, from the clinical guidelines. So uh, American Association of Cardiovascular Pulmonary Rehabilitation, that's the AACVPR. That's one. American Heart Association. So any association that are usually a 501c3, they're a nonprofit organization. They're the ones that do in IRBs, invest, investigative review boards. So they go through something, they, go, they take a fact that they think is a fact and they submit it to an IRB. That IRB study will actually determine from peer review if that is a fact or not. And they'll take a hundred variations of this and dissect that question to be determined if it is fact or not. Then clinicians like me will go on to those resources to obtain those facts that have been peer reviewed to decipher the best outcome or best types of therapies for our patients. Okay, but no worries. Pamela, I love you for that. Google, that was awesome. I love it. But that is not right, guys. Don't go to Google. And what if your doctor was wrong? And what if? You know how many times doctor's been wrong with me? He said, Alex. <laughs> I'm joking with you. Can running your furnace in the, very good question. I actually wanna, I wanna hear this question here. I wanna read this question. All right, the question is, can you, can running your furnace in the winter, furnace in the winter time, dry out your lungs and make it harder to breathe? Can a humidifier help with this and any recommendations on one if it helps ease breathing? Yes. Uh, very, very great question. In the wintertime, we, uh, we lack humidity. So adding a humidifier. Now, not all humidifiers are e created equally. You want to look at what square footage it covers by looking at the manufacturer's instructions. Um, if you cannot, if you, if you, let's say you, uh, you're in a pinch and you cannot have you know, you can't go out to the store because you're snowed in or something. You can't go out to the store to pick up a humidifier. You can easily just go to your bathroom, just get a fan, okay? Go to your bathroom and just turn on the shower, keep your bathroom door open, let the humidity run throughout. I mean, in a pinch, that's what I would have done, all right? And to make breathing a little easier, take two tablespoons, just take two tablespoons of eucalyptus, peppermint, or spearmint. Okay, menthol is a, is a bronchodilator for those that do not know. So if I take spe uh, peppermint, eucalyptus, any one of those, peppermint, spearmint, eucalyptus, any one of those, and actually put it into the water and let it mix in a little bit and then humidify that, it makes the vapors a lot easier to breathe, especially if you're trying to take a shower and it's hard to breathe in that humidity. Take two tablespoons of that and just put it in a shower pan on your floor and you can easily breathe a lot easier because now the eucalyptus or the peppermint or the spearmint is actually opening up your airways, making it easier to breathe when it's hard to take a shower. Okay, so humidity is very important. Uh, any recommendations, anything with a piezoelectric uh, humidifier, piezoelectric, it uses uh, ultrasound. It's very high frequency vibrations. So piezoelectrics are pretty good. Pass over a heated humidifiers. They're fine, you know, there's pros and cons. Um, I usually would always recommend a piezoelectric type of humidifier. That's the one that is not heated. 
they're not heated. Because some people with oxygen, heat and oxygen don't like each other very well, especially fire. You know, fire doesn't like oxygen. <laughs> no, I mean, no, like fire doesn't, oxygen loves fire. Fire doesn't like oxygen, okay? And they, they, they fight and battle each other, meaning as soon as they tie into one another, it blows up. <laughs> so they, they don't like each other like that. Anyways, um, great question. I hope I answered it uh, properly with everything. Do I have any more time? I got three minutes. Three minutes. Anybody have questions? Go ahead. Let me see. Can you reverse COPD? Guys, I can't cure COPD. That is literally a question written up. Can you reverse? A lot of people think I do that. I don't cure it. I do fix it, but I don't cure it. There's a difference. I'm not, there's nothing I'm doing that's curing. I'm just opening up the areas that haven't been opened up, making them more dominant on your breathing, coaching you to stop to breathe shallow and breathing in deeper. And then, of course, exercising you properly. Um, that's what I do over here. And that's what we all do over here, you know. So I don't cure COPD, but just because you go from end stage back up to normal, don't think I'm curing it. I'm not curing anything. There is no cure. Uh, how to stay calm during an uh, attack of asthma and emphysema flares? That's a great question. We've got to make this question for next time because that's a long answer on that question. What does your shirt say? Oh, bruise never broken. Um, you know, for, since I have a little bit of time, I was, people were asking me if I was ever thankful for anything. I said, well, growing up, uh, you know, in Maryland, um, you know, my family didn't have a lot of money at all. And um, so going through college, I lived in my car going through college. And, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks about that besides I loved it because I knew that I could do it. You know, I knew there were some nights I probably wouldn't have woken up the next morning because in Ogden, Utah, it gets down to negative 13 degrees. I, I still handled it. I went out of my car, went for a jog, keep my body temperature up. But that's what I did. Uh, so my point is this, is that um, bruise never broken. It's like, I think all of us have an amazing story. You know, it's not just me that has this amazing story. I think everybody has an amazing story. My story, in a sense, is that I went through, I bru bruised up. I mean, you're talking about from, you know, from uh, fighting to doing all. Uh, for those that don't know, I used to be a fighter. You know, not, I wouldn't say like in a professional basis, but uh, I used to fight in the ring. You know, so I did that. I did, uh, you know, uh, you know, I've won all these awards in pulmonary rehabilitation, you know, and but to get to that point, I mean, I was bleeding left and right. I was I was being bruised up, like left and right, not just from the fighting, from the life of battle, the battle of life, that type of battle as I'm talking about. So a bruise never broken. And yeah, this is. So it just it makes me feel good. That's why I bought this shirt. You know, it makes me feel that's, that's who I am, man. You know, I always, I, you know, people will say, why are you so positive, Alex? I said, well, that's my blood type. Be positive. It's like literally my blood type. And I said, that's funny because I'm always positive. <laughs> I said, you're such a positive guy. What makes you that way? My blood, you know. But, yeah, bruise never broken. Anyways, guys, um, uh, guys, that's it for, uh, for everything. You're very awesome. No, 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 thank you very much. I hope you guys really join us for uh, Pulmonary Rehab this year uh, for 2023. And for people that are in, I'll see you tomorrow. But um, uh, if you're trying to get in the program, just try to get in the program. You'll see what we're talking about. You know, obviously with all these people mentioning, you know, I mean, we haven't really had anybody that did horrible in our program at all. So, I mean, there's a shot of getting you better. We're one of the best shots you got. I'm not kidding. But just put a little trust in me, and I'll, I'll get you there, okay? I know how it's like. I know how it's like to, you know, to kind of have your own, just yourself, and that's it. No one else motivating you, helping you. I wouldn't mind being that motivation. I'm just letting you know. I mean, from ex-military, uh, your brother or sister, hey, I, I'm, I'm there for you any day of the week. You know, just get it on, you know. So if you need help, uh, no, no, no one's ever left behind. You know what I mean? So just trying to get in the program, just let me know. It's not a big deal. Guys, that's it. See you guys. Bye-bye.